academic webinar. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jeannie Fong, a program manager at the Curry Center. This webinar is one session in the nurse education series by the TBCOEs and NTNC. We have over 388 registered participants joining us from across the United States. This, today's session is being recorded and will, will be archived on our work, webinar. Please look out for our email announcing when it will become available in two to three weeks. You have all been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please feel free to share them in the chat box. The faculty will address the questions during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. If you're listening via phone, please enter the code provided to you within the Adobe Connect to link your phone and, and computer if you haven't already done so. This code would be automatically displayed to you if you selected the phone option on the audio menu. It can also be located by clicking on the lower case I in the rubber upper right hand corner. This can help us manage the audio problems as they may arise. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, which is part of the University of California, San Francisco. And our office is located in Berkeley, California. The Curry Center is one of four TB centers of excellence for training, education, and medical consultation. We cover the western region of the US, which is shown in the purple on the map. Our region consists of 17 jurisdictions and also includes the US Pacific Island territories. This project was funded by the CDC's cooperative agreement and is a project of the University of California, San Francisco. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's facilitator, Brenda Montoya Dennison. Brenda is the TB program manager with the New Mexico Department of Health TB program. Prior to becoming TB program manager, she was the TB nurse case manager and TB nurse consultant for the Albuquerque metro area in New Mexico for five years. She has been a nurse for 21 years. She has worked in Washington State and Tennessee also as a TB nurse. She is currently serving as a low incidence rep on the NTNC board through NTCA. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Jeannie, and welcome, everyone. The Curry Center is an approved provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This webinar is approved for a total of one continuing education contact hour for nurses. To receive nursing units, you must have registered for the webinar, participated in the entire training, and completed the online evaluation. The evaluation link will be emailed to all registered course participants immediately following the webinar. We ask that you complete it within one week. Pre-registration is important so that we can ensure we don't exceed the capacity of our Adobe Connect webinar system. However, as mentioned earlier, if any individuals or group members have not pre-registered, please click on the link provided by Jeannie in the chat box so they can receive an evaluation link to complete. Today's presenters have signed a declaration of disclosure and have indicated they have nothing to disclose. Immediately following the introduction and overview, 
We will be moving on to the nurse case management presentation, Pandemic Woes, followed by the Q&A session and conclusion. Please remember to leave questions in the chat box, and in the interest of time, questions should be held until the end. It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Daryl Beach is one of two nurse consultants for the New Mexico Department of Health. He is a military veteran, former paramedic, and started his nurse career as a member of the emergency department of a level three trauma center. Currently, he provides TB consult, consult services and support for 21 counties in New Mexico. Libby Enriquez is a TB nurse consultant for the New Mexico Department of Health, a nurse of 19 years, working nine of those years in case management with five focused on TB. She works closely with IHS Navajo Nation TB and is the point of contact as the corrections liaison for New Mexico, while also providing consultation services in the Southwest and Northwest regions. So let's begin our presentation today, Tuberculosis Nurse Case Management Pandemic Woes. Today we will be reviewing a TB case and demonstrate how our New Mexico team managed treatment through the global pandemic, something that everybody is working through now. As mentioned earlier, none of our presenters have any disclosures or all of our presenters have um, no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Today's learning objectives are list two goals of TB nurse case management aimed to achieve positive outcomes for patients diagnosed with TB. Describe several roles the TB case manager will undertake to facilitate quality of care with active TB and other comorbidities. And list two strategies to promote adherence with TB treatment and incorporate these strategies to support treatment adherence in their work settings. A little background on the TB program in New Mexico. We are a centralized program that is responsible for TB management and treatment activities throughout New Mexico. There are 33 counties and 56 health offices within the state. The TB program consists of TB program manager, TB medical director, two nurse consultants, and two contracted nurse consultants who work part-time. TB services are managed at the local health level by the public health nurses there. Services include comprehensive medical and nurse case management for all persons with active TB and their contacts, comprehensive medical and nurse, nursing case management for high-risk patients infected with TB, statewide surveillance for both TB disease and TB infection, and providing education to community partners and the public on TB topics. This leads us to our first polling question. We have 125 participants right now, and we're interested to see how many years of experience do all of you have managing active cases? Our choices are zero to six months, six months to one year, one to three years, and more than three years. Please go ahead and provide us some information on your experience. And we'd love to take this and be able to see how um, we can facilitate or help in your current practice and maybe be able to um, provide mentorships to those who are new or give you more information. So I see many of you guys have already entered your response, so let's go ahead and end the poll, Jeannie, and let's see what those results look like. Can, can we broadcast the results? I'm not seeing it. So it looks like 45% uh, or 48% of the attendees today have more than three years experience, but we also have a good group that have less than three. 
So um, welcome. We have a great, well-rounded group here. So let's move on. Thanks, Jeannie. So nurse case management has, defined, has been defined several different ways. This definition is from the American Institute for Healthcare Professionals. Case management is a care delivery model that is focused on managing the components of care for patients within or across the continuum of care with the goals of achieving quality care outcomes and financial appropriateness. Today, we'll, re we'll be reviewing case management through the lens of tuberculosis. So let's review what those public health goals are in case management. They're identify, one is identify and treat suspected confirmed cases of active TB, ensuring each patient receives TB care and treatment according to published standards of care. Also rendering the patient non-infectious and preventing transmission of TB within the community through, a, through effective contact investigations and infection control activities. Ensuring completion of adequate therapy, prevent the development of drug resistance through providing directly observed therapy, monitoring treatment response, performing appropriate laboratory tests, such as drug susceptibilities, and implementing in intervention early if resistance is suspected. Also is identifying other urgent health and psychosocial needs, which will be discussed in this case study. Nurse case managers are responsible for the coordination of the various elements that are involved in the care of the individual patient. Their role is to use resources and services in the best way possible. Nurse case managers oversee the process of care delivered to patients, work collaboratively, and provide leadership to the healthcare team. In other words, the nurse is the captain of the ship. Here you can see some of the roles that are involved in TB nurse case management. For example, the nurse's role is to provide con continuity of care throughout the patient's course of treatment when transitions in care occur, such as inpatient admissions, transfers to outpatient settings, relocation, or return to work or school. Now I'll hand it over to Daryl, who will begin the case study. Good day, everyone. The case today involves a 79-year-old female. She was born in the United States and was Native American. At the time of her diagnosis, she was living off the reservation. Her comorbidities included Alzheimer's disease in an advanced state, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, asthma, and paranoia. Her care was provided at home by her two daughters, and she lived with one of them. Due to her chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, she had regular follow-ups with her pulmonologist. According to records, after a visit in January of 2020, the doctor noted a left upper lobe nodule that needed to be followed up. A chest CT was performed in February. The new CT noted changes from studies done earlier. Due to those changes, an induced sputum was collected in March. Here you see some images from the case. On the left is a chest x-ray from June of 2019. The chest x-ray showed no pleural effusion. There was patchy peripheral left basilar opacity that was suspicious for pneumonia. But it was similar in appearance to a study done from 2017. In February of 2020, a chest CT was performed. The key points of the impression were the development of multifocal lower lung consolidation, bronchial wall thickening, and cavitation and cystic bronchiectasis with numerous clustered micronodules. Most severe was in the right lower lobe with a fibrocavitary disease appearance. According to the report, tuberculosis would be atypical but should be considered. The left upper lobe seen in previous CTs was unchanged.
In typical nursing fashion, late Friday afternoon on March 13th, the TB program received notice of a new TB case. AFB smears were 4 plus. Now 4 plus means that many bacteria were seen under the microscope. It could also indicate that she could be more infectious and able to spread the bacteria to others. The induced sputum was PCR positive for MTBC. PCR, or polyamorous chain reaction, is a type of nucleic acid amplification test, or NAT, that rapidly copies specific DNA, allowing identification of the sample as mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. The Department of Health consulted with the TB medical director, and RIPE orders were received. RIPE is an acronym for the four frontline medications to treat tuberculosis. It stands for rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambitol. The patient's caregivers, her daughters, were contacted, and arrangements were made for a first home visit on the following Monday. On that same Friday the 13th, the first case of COVID-19 in New Mexico was reported to the Department of Health. The TB notification occurred at the time that the Department of Health was starting to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Wrong direction. So let's have All another. All right, so we're here on our second polling question. So what would your response to the funeral request be considering information provided? We will give you time to answer as I review the options. Should we provide the patient with TB medications and allow her to take self-administered doses? Refer to Indian Health Services and request they provide treatment? Provide TB education, highlighting client's infectious state, current medical status, and allow them to make the informed decision? or serve them with a health order for mandatory isolation. Great, I see folks coming in. And wait a couple more seconds. Okay, I think we're ready, Jeannie. Can you close the poll? Thank you. So it appears the majority chose to serve uh, the family with a health order for mandatory isolation. So let's review. Uh, number one, due to our patient's new diagnosis, infectious state, and early on in treatment, this is not an option at this time. In New Mexico, we focus on directly observed therapy to ensure the administration of medications and prevent the de uh, development of drug resistance. Also, keep in mind, we closely monitor for tolerance and adverse reactions, especially in the first two weeks. Number two, if the patient was staying for an extended period of time, this could potentially be an option. Um, but this would have to be coordinated prior to through the New Mexico TB program and the Navajo Nation TB program. Number three, the family needed guidance and explanation to make a decision. This helped them take into account multiple factors. Number four, we did not go with this because the family understood the need to treat, were compliant, and did not refuse treatment. They were just seeking guidance and understanding of all this um, new diagnosis. All right, let's move on. So our approach, as we come into the family's personal space, um, we want to enhance and deepen the family's knowledge of TB. We want to empower their decision-making by listening, acknowledging, and in turn starting that relationship and trust. We also want to empathize and show compassion. We have to be able to be aware of their cultural, spiritual needs and practices. 
while still considering public safety as we develop a plan to successfully prevent transmission by providing specific instruction if the family decides to make the trip, provide treatment to standard recommendations, and to continue to identify additional barriers to TV therapy. While travel was discouraged, we acknowledged the family's needs and provided detailed instructions, such as wear your mask, keep windows open, and avoid large crowds. On the positive side, we were informed the funeral services were taking place outdoors. All right, well, thank you for your feedback. Let's continue with the case scenario. Okay, so we're going to back up just a tiny bit. Um, we led into the, the pop quiz there without a little bit of um, baseline information. Uh, when the patient started therapy, baseline labs are drawn, and the local case manager provided education to the family about TB, infectiousness, isolation, treatment, and treatment phases. It was right after the education that the family requested to go to the funeral. Then we just kind of popped that quiz on you. However, <laughs> in the end, the daughters decided not to travel to the funeral since self-isolation would not allow for interaction with family members. Treatment continued, but then on March 31st, she developed nausea and abdominal pain. Medications were held and blood was drawn. As you can see, highlighted in red, her liver enzymes were elevated. This is concerning because the medications could cause hepatotoxicity. After her symptoms resolved, a drug challenge was started. Rifampin and ethambutol were first started. A chemistry panel was redrawn. Then isoniazid was added after the chemistry was reviewed. On April 16th, the doctor decided to discontinue the PZA, so the client did not get the standard 40 doses, and this would automatically cause her treatment to be extended to nine months. She did continue on the INH, rifampin, and ethambutol. On April 13th, drug sensitivity testing found the tuberculosis to be pansensitive. That is, it is sensitive to all first-line medications. Usually, when this report is received, the ethambutol is discontinued. However, with all the chaos at the start of COVID, it was not stopped until May the 6th. With the pandemic, public health staff responded to the resulting public health order. Priority test sites were initiated. Public health office services were reprioritized. COVID caused an upheaval in regular routines to accommodate testing. Due to the shutdown, schedules and home visits had irregular times and staff based on COVID-19 response requirements. Patients started to see different nurses at different times. The caregivers and the patient became concerned with having consistency and routine provided. Changes in routine increased the anxiety of the patient. So, what do you think? Okay, so this leads us in, on to our third polling question. We are approximately one month into treatment now. How would you ensure adherence to treatment during this COVID pandemic? You can start placing your votes. So would you provide and allow self-administered doses until this emergency order is lifted? Offer and allow the use of video DOT, work after hours to provide the necessary TB therapy, or meet outdoors in a neutral location to, uh, to provide the DOT. All right, everybody seems like they're the majority choosing video DOT. Okay. So let's close the poll, Jeannie, and we will review the answers. Okay. So option number one, this does not follow the national standard for TB treatment, um, which is directly observed therapy for active treatment. In New Mexico, only in rare and limited occasions, like weekends or holidays, um, SAT dosing may be considered but must have a prior approval. 
Number two, this is a great choice uh, if your program allows and has access to this platform. Number three, this was not a consideration as our public health nurses were already working over time to cover COVID services. And number four, we did not go with this option because it was still not addressing the current situation um, as our local public health nurses are being reassigned to COVID duties. All right, so our New Mexico TV program has been utilizing video DOT since 2018 and felt it was the best option for this family. Um, this platform consists of a HIPAA-compliant app that um, the patient has to download on their smartphone. Um, they can record themselves taking their TB dose for the day. Uh, the nurse then has the ability to watch and approve or reject the video from her computer desktop. Uh, the benefits of having this asynchronous platform is the patient is able to take the dose at any time of the day or night that better fits his or her schedule. So the family was trained and we were eager and we're eager to get started. This gave them some peace of mind that therapy would continue with minimal interruption. Now this in turn allowed the nurses the flexibility to monitor the patient's treatment while still able to focus on their COVID duties. All right, well thank you. Let's continue with the case. Oh, thank you. Now armed with video DOT, the patient continued her treatment. In less than two months after treatment started, smear and culture conversion were achieved. Per New Mexico protocol, smear conversion is calculated as the first of three consecutive neg negative sputum smears. Culture conversion is the first date of two consecu consecutive negative sputum cultures. With pan sensitivity and culture conversion in less than two months, indications are that treatment is effective and going in the right direction. Patient continued treatment by means of video DOT. However, on June the 3rd, she had a psychiatric episode and was transported to a local emergency department and was admitted for observation and psych consult. While admitted, she was released from isolation after her third negative smear. She was then admitted to a behavior health hospital. At, time, at that time, she also tested negative for COVID-19. She remained admitted until June 22nd when she was discharged home. Again, she was tested for, for COVID and again, it was negative. She did have some changes in her psychotropic medications, which led the no, local nurse case manager to research for drug interactions to minimize potential adverse reactions. Treatment continued at home, but her daughters began reporting increasing difficulty in managing her care and her ADLs at home. On July 13th, she had a fall breaking her hip. She was admitted to a hospital and the daughters notified the public health department. The local case manager contacted that hospital to ensure continued treatment and education that the client was non-infectious. When she was ready for discharge, again, the local case manager assisted the daughters in locating a facility that had not been overrun by COVID and who would accept the patient. All right, so on to the next polling question. How would you facilitate continuity of care to minimize treatment interruption, travel to facility to provide the DOT, allow the family to administer TB medications at the facility, pull TB therapy until the patient is discharged, or collaborate with the housing facility to provide TB treatment. Perfect, yes, majority are going with collaborate with facility for treatment. Thank you, let's close the poll. All right, due to this COVID-19, many restrictions were in place now. One of them was the visiting, uh, one of them was the visiting restriction, so uh, this was not possible for option one. Number two, 
uh, directly observed therapy is the standard care for all active patients in New Mexico. So this was the, uh, not an option as well. Number three, this is not considered. If there's no reasonable cause to hold TB therapy, medication should not be held. And number four, the appropriate, appropriate measure would be to collaborate with the facility uh, staff via phone, fax, email, any way possible to maintain that communication. Next. Okay, so our approach now. Our overall aim is to connect, build uh, a relationship, and effectively communicate with uh, attending providers and facility staff. We want to make sure to uh, the transition in care, administration of appropriate therapy, and provide specific instruction for the best patient outcome. This is an example letter provided to attending facilities designed to deliver current patient information, specific directives, signs and symptoms to monitor for, and our program recommendations. We want to operate as a support system for continued guidance and encourage positive response. We have provided a sample letter that will be available on the handout section below for you to download. This brings us to the update. Patient received 100 of 195 planned doses. She was transferred to a new long-term care facility, and that facility provided the TB medications, but adherence varied daily. Patient required some redirection and assistance with ADLs due to her advanced Alzheimer's disease. After rehab care was finished, she was discharged to inpatient hospice at that same facility. With hospice, the family began discussing end-of-life medical decisions. Unfortunately, the patient passed away on September 24th. A medical review by the TB program medical director determined that TB was not a factor in her passing. All right, so this case presented numerous challenges that the uh, public health nurse had to work through, uh, from the client's complex medical conditions, adherence issues, um, and multiple family loss, TB treatment responses, there were side effects, drug challenges, psychotropic med changes, um, to the transitions, the multiple transitions in care. Um, and as many of you can relate to, this COVID pandemic that has turned our world upside down. We were forced to adapt and adjust. Despite the multiple challenges and heartbreaking passing of our client, there was a network of people who worked together to make a difference. We accomplished good rapport with patient and family that led to a trusting relationship. There was response to treatment as evident by the AFB smear and culture conversion within the two month mark. Diligence and patience assured our clients stayed on proper treatment between facilities. Contacts were identified and tested, allowing the completion of our contact investigations. Uh, I want to recognize the local uh, nurse case manager for her remarkable work and effort. The outcome and feedback from the mul multiple facilities were exceptional. We are nurses, we are healthcare workers, and at the front line for both TB and COVID. This is the year of the nurse. You make a tremendous difference. Thank you for joining us. As mentioned earlier, there are several available resources on case management and TB case management. Listed here are some selections used for our presentation. I would also like to highlight the Indian Country 101 reference. This is published by the New Mexico Department of Health and can be used as a resource when working with tribal nations. The link is provided here. Okay, it's time for questions. So we have two options. There's the phone option and also the chat field. So if you're going to uh, be using the phone option, please press star six on your phone to unmute and then ask your question. So I'll wait a few, few seconds to see if there's anybody
that has a question, and if not, we can move on to the chat. Okay, I think we should move on to the chat. Okay, we have a few questions in our chat. One is specifically talking about the video DOT. So when we talk about video T, um, video DOT, the question is, is eDOT the name of the HIPAA compliant app? And Libby, I think you may be able to answer that question for us. So the e is not the eDOT is not the name of the specific um, vendor that we use. It's just eDOT is meaning electronic directly observed therapy. And there are some HIPAA compliant um, apps that you can use for eDOT or VDOT, video DOT. I know that there's a CDC uh, toolkit for electronic DOT that is probably about 15 pages long on the website. It does have several different providers. There's some health departments that use Face, uh, FaceTime, Skype for Business, Zoom, and other um, video conferencing, and then there are some specific, um, I think Sure It Here is one, Emoca is one that other health departments use. So there is a good list of them on that toolkit. Let's see, we have some other questions coming in. Daryl, can you explain a little bit more about what does pan-sensitive mean and maybe why we stopped the ethambutol use? You talked about it a little bit, but if you can maybe cover that a little bit more, maybe for our newer nurses. Pan-sensitivity is a term used to define uh, that the tuberculosis is sensitive to the four frontline medications. Uh, the reason we uh, stopped the ethambutol when that report is received is to maintain um, its use as a safety net uh, against resistance. Um, we don't want long-term use uh, for the patient to develop resistance, and also long-term use of ethambutol can cause vision problems. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I have another question coming through, also on the EDOT. Uh, Libby, can you answer the, can EDOT be used with other, other phones besides smartphones? Typically not. You have to have the ability to download the, um, the app, and typically that's with a smartphone has a capability. And I believe you have to be able to record video. So a front-facing camera is um, highly recommended. I believe that some of the apps um, and platforms could use uh, tablets or computers with webcams. So you'd have to look specifically to all those different um, applications. Let's see, we have a question here. Where were, were there any cultural issues that were encountered in this case? Uh, Daryl, if you can speak to that. Uh, there were several cultural issues with this case. Uh, primarily, the, the patient being Native American, um, we wanted to, to observe and recognize um, their traditions, their beliefs. Um, the fact that with the Alzheimer's, her, her reality was um, a changed view um, to what I guess what our normal reality would be. So we we had to be uh, sensitive to you know what she um, recognized as her normal. Thank you, Daryl. I have a question, Daryl. Probably again for you. We talked a little bit about a case contact investigation just briefly. But the question is, uh, if there were any positives and, and the result of the contact investigation? Well, fortunately, uh, since the client was primarily homebound with her Alzheimer's disease, the contact investigation was uh, just a small cohort. There was one identified as positive and successfully treated.
And let's see, a question regarding, is a patient considered contagious until their first negative sputum culture? Libby, do you think you can address that one? Yes. So a patient is considered contagious, or I should say non-contagious, until we can collect three sputum specimens that are smear negative. And then that's when we can consider them non-infectious. I hope that was information to answer that question. Um, I have another one. Let's see. With the patient having advanced dementia, was a contract made with a family men member to administer medications for video DOT? And I can answer that question. Um, the family member assisted with the video, um, with recording the video. However, the patient did continue to take her own meds, um, and so that was very helpful. Um, but both we received, you know, she consented, um, and the, the actual caregiver had the authority um, and the power of attorney for her medical, so she could also consent on providing that medication. Um, I also have a question, and I may need a little bit more clarification on this one. Um, it's, what was the cause in this case? So let me see if there's a little bit more to that question. So I believe, I see you typing maybe, so hopefully we'll get a little, what was the cause of death? Thank you for the clarification. Um, she was really ill uh, at the end. I believe she developed a pneumonia. Um, she had a failure to thrive, um, had stopped eating and drinking, also had a UTI. Um, and so it was more of a failure to thrive um, cause of death. The TB didn't, uh, the doctor's words were, didn't help, um, but it was not the ultimate cause of death. I see another question in the chat. Um, Oregon, it looks like the state of Oregon has looked into one of the EDOTs for EMOCA. Um, so like I said, again, um, some of them range in several different costs. So it's always best to look around, shop around, and see what best works for your program. Um, there is a question about a patient being, so if the patient is MDR, what is the patient, when is the patient considered non-contagious? And Libby, do you want to try that one? Yes. So my understanding is, okay, what, when is the patient considered non-contagious? Um, For MDR, and I'm sorry, I should have uh, elaborated. MDR yeah. is multiple drug resistance. So it's still, it's still the same process, is the collection and micro, um, is monitoring their sputum specimens, testing for AFB, and it would be three consecutive AFB smear negatives to consider them non-infectious. We still go on and um, we say that they culture convert when they have two consecutive AFB culture negatives. So uh, uh, it's still the smears. It's three consecutive AFB smears that are needed to consider them non-infectious. And MDR cases are always a little trickier, so always having consultation with um, the experts to determine that um, cultures may be negative, may need to be negative also for um, MDR cases to be considered non-contagious. So always look to your COEs and for those expert TB consultations with those MDR cases. I have another question. Was the source of the infection ever determined? And I believe it's the source of maybe the TB infection uh, was determined. Yes, okay. So generally, you know, Determining that TB infection in most active cases is something difficult. Unless you know that they're part of an outbreak and you can link them 
together or you have epidemiology links to them, you can say, yes, uh, this patient got it from this patient who got it from this patient, and you can see those clearly. But most of the time, infections or TB cases are from infections that were long, long time ago. And so to be able to tell a patient, I know exactly how you got infected and where it came from is a little difficult. So um, when you get those cases that you can tie the links or their family members or their ongoing outbreaks, those are a little easier to, to navigate. Is there any questions on the phone line? I think silence. So any other questions or comments? We have a little more time scheduled. Brenda, I see one that I would like to address. Uh, sure, from Tammy, Harold. From Tammy Cooper, the, was treatment continued after admission to hospice care? Uh, the answer to that is yes. She received treatment uh, right up until the day before she passed away. We worked really hard, and, and I will say another shout out to the nurse that was the local case manager. You, she really collaborated with those all the different facilities the patient was in, explained how important DOT was, and explained that DOT was not just handing the pills in a cup and walking out of that room to ensure that patient took the medication. And there were some challenges with that um, on new admissions, you know, the change to a new facility. There were a day or two that, that they had difficulty having the patient take her meds, but um, luckily she was able to resume after maybe two days of being missed. So a question came in, were precautions taken at the morgue? Um, I don't know the specific question, the answer to that. Um, I'm hoping that they knew the diagnosis when they um, transitioned the patient to the morgue. Um, for further um, processing, uh, I, I believe that they, they do take precautions. So I'm hoping the answer to that is they use airborne um, precautions and use respirators when um, doing that. Any other questions? concerns. Again, we work really closely with our facilities, not only educating them about directly observed therapy um, and what that looks like, but documenting uh, the doses. And we, we teach our facilities and um, the providers there what side effects to look for. Um, and then we also monthly receive the documentation of the medication that was administered so that we can count them as doses and include them in her treatment. Yeah. And uh, there was a note that um, somebody did point out, yes, by the time that she went to the morgue, she wasn't infectious. So really the only thing that they need to worry about is if they're going to aerosolize any parts of, of the area that may have some bacteria in it. And then to add on, she had culture um, and smear converted within her two months. So. So another question, uh, what kind of precautions are taken until the patient is considered non-infectious? Daryl, do you want to try to answer what kind of precautions we use as TB nurses in public health to see our patients while they're infectious? Well, we, when we uh, see a patient who that is infectious, uh, we use airborne precautions, N95 mask, gloves. Um, if possible, we try and um, like meet the patient out on the front porch, um, so there's a you know greater air volume. Um, we encourage the patient to you know isolate themselves uh, just to reduce the um, possibility of infection within the house. Um, let's see, what else? 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, things get a little tricky with COVID, um, and so we really made sure that our nurses went above and beyond what we normally do for precautions. So in a normal situation and not in this um, crazy time, we, we use N95 respirators that all the nurses are fit tested to. Um, the added precautions were for COVID, so gown, mask, um, glove, shield if they're doing anything with coughing, um, and then outside. We also encourage patients to always increase and improve ventilation in their homes. And so here in New Mexico, we're really lucky with our weather that we can have patients open windows and let the sun shine in. Sometimes we can sit out on the porch and have um, provide DOT and chit chat, and it, it provides safety for our patient for our nurses, and include in, increases just that DOT and kind of relationship building with our patients. So. Um, anything you can do to improve ventilation, have windows open, meet outdoors, uh, wear your mask. If patients are coughing, make sure that they're following cough etiquette by covering their cough. And if there's any children in the house, you know, kind of limit the amount of time they stay with the young children. So I'm going to ask one more time to check those phone lines and see if there's any other questions coming in. And we have a few more minutes for those last minute questions on phone or in chat. And I'll remind everybody that the slide and the template for the letter that we provide to other facilities are in the handout section. Feel free to take that template and edit it to uh, your liking. Um, we found that it's very helpful that not only do we talk to those providers in the facilities, but they actually have something written that they keep in the patient's chart so that they can see what our recommendations is, have our contact information, know, you know what the medicines are, know when to stop. We provide them with our forms that have our side effects and our documenting of daily DOT as a template for their facility. They are always welcome to use their own documentation and just provide us copies or use our documentation. So um, I hope that all of that was helpful to you all. So we have a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up. I want to thank Daryl and Libby and the team at the Curry Center for putting this all together and working with us. This was a very difficult case, and I'm sure that many of you out there are also struggling with how to handle both the COVID um, pandemic that's going on and how to adjust your programs and your treatment and your care to all the TB patients that we are still seeing. So um, I hope this was able to provide at least some hit, hints, tips, and some references that you can um, look for. Um, always reach out. The CDC, again, has that wonderful toolkit. And the NTCA and NTNC, I know, is updating some case management. Um, references and resources. The Curry Center has some great nurse case management um, resources there for you all. So please remember to complete your online evaluation within one week. And your evaluation links have now been emailed to all registered participants. Uh, thank you, um, Brenda. So um, for those who have completed all the required steps, your nursing CEUs or participant certificates will be available on the Curry website within 12 weeks. We will send an email with the certificates are available. 
Um, one last reminder before you all log off. Um, group members who did not register, please provide us with your info by clicking on the link below. Um, then, you'll send, then we'll send the online evalu evaluation to complete. If you have any other questions, please e email us here. Um, um, for your convenience, I'll leave the Adobe Connect connection open for another five to ten minutes so you could click on the link to register. Thank you for joining us today and hope to see you all again in the future trainings. Thank you very much.